the purpose of red flags as a tool is to identify risk areas of inquiry. So it's you know, a form of possible clues. But red flags under this view may or may not lead to evidence of corruption. And so alone, they're insufficient to serve as a foundation for a finding of corruption and require substantiation. Welcome to the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practice Group's podcast, All Things Investigations. The Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Investigation Practices Group represents many of the premier companies around the world, providing advice on issues spanning the full anti-corruption and compliance spectrum. In this podcast, host Tom Fox and members of the Hughes Hubbard Anti-Corruption and Internal Practice Group will highlight some of the key legal issues involved in white collar and other investigations, both domestically and internationally. We will tackle topical issues involved in investigations, as well as explore how companies can prevent and detect issues that arise in conducting investigations on a worldwide basis. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I'm thrilled to have with me Laura Perkins and Jan Dunin Boskovich. They are with Hughes Hubbard, and we're going to talk about the intersection of international arbitration and anti bribery and anti corruption compliance. They wrote a really interesting article that tied both of those two disciplines together in a way I had not really thought through. It turns out there's a vibrant community of people in the arbitration world fighting corruption through arbitration and litigation in arbitration. So I asked them if they could come and visit with me, and they graciously agreed to do so. So Laura, if I could start with you, could you tell us your professional background? Absolutely. Hello, and thank you, Tom, for having me. I'm presently a partner at Hughes Hubbard and Reed. I'm the co-managing partner of our Washington, D.C. office and the co-chair of our anti-corruption and internal investigations practice group. Prior to joining Hughes Hubbard, I spent about 10 years at the Department of Justice in the criminal division fraud section, where I had a number of roles, including assistant chief in the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act unit. So I have spent a a substantial part of my career working anti-corruption matters and cases, prosecutions, and since leaving DOJ, advising companies on anti-corruption enforcement, compliance, and investigations. Well, thank you so much for having me on your program. I've been almost 10 years with Pew Serpent and Reed, counsel based in the Paris office. I was trained in France and in the U.S., and my practice today is really in three areas anti-corruption and internal investigations, economic sanctions and trade compliance, and international dispute resolution. And so I'm very excited to be speaking with you today. If I could start with asking a basic question of how does compliance or anti-bribery, anti-corruption compliance intersect with international arbitration? So we've seen a growing trend in this over time. It's really an intersection between anti-corruption and compliance, and then sort of a follow-on with arbitration, where the growth in the attention to anti-corruption compliance has really started bringing about more arbitrations in this space as companies become more attuned to the red flags for corruption and, frankly, stop paying some of their third parties based on potential corruption or corruption suspicions. Often those agreements with third parties are governed by contracts that contain arbitration clauses. So we've seen a number of third parties then sue the companies trying to get compensation under their contracts. And the company needs to defend itself in the arbitration and is left with sort of the possibility of raising these compliance and anti-corruption red flags as a defense to the case that has been brought against them by the third party. So I think that the growth in the attention to anti-corruption compliance has really resulted in a growth in the amount of arbitration that touches on these matters. I absolutely agree. I I think it's generally, it seems fair to say that corruption and compliance claims or allegations are, are now very common 
in both commercial arbitration and in investment treaty arbitration. As I'm sure many of the listeners know, arbitration has been for a long time and continues to be the preferred means for resolving cross-border disputes. And the fight against corruption is now really recognized as an international effort. And so it's in a way, I would say maybe natural, but you know, these two trends, arbitration being the preferred means to resolve the disputes and the fight against corruption having really gone global, has created a context where these two topics would inevitably come to meet at some point. And what we've noticed is that there are different ways for these topics to meet. And that's because there's a variety of situations where these claims, these allegations can come up in a dispute. It can either be because there's a contracts for corruption, contracts with third parties, intermediaries. There could be commercial or state contracts, and it's alleged that were procured through corruption. Or there could be allegations that the states have treated, have addressed matters related to corruption in a way that is improper. So you have now a full spectrum of scenarios, of situations where parties can raise these questions. And I would say that the trend is really that most of the time, the question of corruption or compliance is raised defensively, although we do see cases where these topics are, are raised as part of the main claim. I thought one of the real insights in your article was something you just touched on, Jan, which was anti-corruption as public policy. And Laura, I know, or you mentioned your work at the Department of Justice prior to coming on board with Hugh Hubbard, and you've been in this field for quite some time. I've been in this field for quite some time. You were a prosecutor, prosecuting companies for violating the law. I was helping companies comply with that law. But we really seem to have evolved much past that. So I was wondering if you might be able to talk about that evolution, what are both of you have seen from simply a legal a law to a legal requirement to compliance with a legal requirement to really worldwide public policy that can be utilized in a variety of forums? Yeah, there's definitely been a growth in that. Again, I've been in this space now for a while, I'll say. And like you said, Tom, when I first got started, it really was more about compliance with one law, not even sort of globally, right? Other laws, it really, companies were focused on compliance with the FCPA and not so much a look at the global expectations, really, or the importance of fighting corruption across the globe and sort of the dangers that corruption can bring. I think that there has been a real, again, a real growth in the recognition that corrupt countries, corrupt leaders can result in a lot of other issues. I know the Department of Justice and sort of the U.S. has been, has taken a strong position starting several administrations ago, but, you know, just to bring it recent, under the Biden administration too, has taken a strong position that foreign corruption and corruption generally can be a real national security concern for the United States. So I think the sort of corruption and the public policy views on it have evolved over time and have gone global, which has also resulted in a number of other countries enacting or starting to actually enforce their own foreign bribery laws. And that has been, I think, a significant evolution over the last two or so decades. And then from the arbitration space, what started noticing, I would say, around the mid 2000s is you know, a recognition that bribery is contrary to international public policy. And what's a significant development, or I should say perhaps a, a milestone, is when an international tribunal reached the conclusion that it wouldn't be able to enforce a contract that was based or obtained by corruption as enforcing this contract would run against transnational public policy. So it's really the emergence of a new actor in the global anti-corruption movement that recognizes the architecture of the fight against corruption and is crafting new principles and new rules and then applied to these disputes. So you start seeing this, this trend I think starting from 2006 onwards, and it's now become very common. Why do you all think the stakes can be so high when these issues around corruption are raised in international business disputes in the arbitration context? There are several reasons. And as I mentioned, there are cases where allegations of corruption are made both in 
commercial arbitration and investment state arbitration. But so if you take these two areas of international dispute resolution, overall, you could say that the consequences of you know, making a successful claim of corruption can be very dramatic. It can be very dramatic because, first of all, it may lead to a tribunal denying jurisdiction over a dispute. So if there is a finding of corruption, a tribunal may simply say, well, we will not hear the case. Similarly, you may have tribunals come to a conclusion that a particular claim is not admissible. So that argument, that claim cannot proceed, but the, the entire case is not necessarily tossed out. It is also obviously very dramatic. It may be very dramatic because it can go to the very center of a dispute and so have an impact on the merits of the claim. The allegation may lead to a settlement. It may also lead to, if an arbitration award is challenged in the domestic courts, it may lead to the award being set aside. It may also lead to unsuccessful efforts enforcing the award, and it may finally lead to party having to waive rights to an arbitration award. So in other words, it is very serious, very dramatic, and needless to say, it can also attract the attention of other stakeholders if these awards come to light because they're challenged in, in the courtrooms. Yeah, I think that's just, just one thing to highlight there is the possibility. I mean, often arbitration is private. So these sort of putting forth corruption allegations, it's not really putting them into the public sphere. But if an arbitration award is challenged in a court, then it becomes public. So the reputational stakes increase at that time. And on top of the sort of large dollar values that can be at issue in some of these arbitrations, at times arbitrations relate to contracts with third parties, but other times they relate to the actual contract with the government, which could be hundreds of millions of dollars that has purportedly been obtained through corruption. So you're talking potential reputational damage if it becomes public, you're talking very large dollar values that are at issue. So the stakes in some of these arbitrations and with some of these corruption claims can actually be quite significant. So what are some of the outcomes that can arise when a claim of corruption is brought up defensively or perhaps even used by a plaintiff in pursuing some cause of action against the defendant? So I think Jan touched on a couple of them in his previous response. But I mean, it can be found that there's no jurisdiction. It can be that the claim gets thrown out. It can result in certain evidence being allowed or not allowed. So there's a number of different possibilities and and sort of possible outcomes here. And perhaps one thing that is worth emphasizing is that before the question of the outcome of the dispute, so of what the consequences are, if one party is successful in bringing the cases, the question of, well, what happens in the proceedings when a party raises a claim of corruption? Because I think that's very specific to the arbitration space. You know, once a party raises a corruption claim, that will prompt a discussion on what to do and how to treat this allegation. And here, I think, for from the perspective of thinking about this intersection between the worlds of compliance and the worlds of dispute resolution and arbitration in particular, there's one topic that we think, and we noted in the article, is of of particular interest. And what we're seeing is this general reliance on red flags as a tool to address corruption claims in arbitration. Here, perhaps one thought I would share is that along with standard of proof and burden shifting, the function of red flags in international arbitration is very debated. And I think it's very interesting because compliance professionals will likely have a very clear idea of what a red flag is. But that notion can take, can mean something slightly different in the context of these cases. So more specifically, one view is to say essentially that the purpose of red flags as a tool is to identify risk areas of inquiry. So it's a form of possible clues. But red flags under this view may or may not lead to evidence of corruption. And so alone, they're insufficient to serve as a foundation for a finding of corruption and require substantiation. That's the first view. The second view would essentially say that 
a red flag or red flags, if you aggregate them, and that's, I suppose, the related question, if you can aggregate red flags, if a red flag or red flags can serve as a basis for making legal presumptions. And in particular, if you aggregate them, can you make a finding that there was corruption in a case? And so in arbitration, essentially, can you draw the civil consequences of criminal conduct? And so a question here under this view is, well, you know, what's the value of country risk? And I don't think if you're looking at country risk purely from a compliance perspective, when you're performing due diligence, for instance, that would necessarily lead you to the same conclusion as if you're using country risk from this perspective, where a red flag is proof or can be part of the evidence that there was corruption in a given case. And so I think that's one of the most significant and centrally debated questions in arbitration today when it comes to corruption and compliance. Let me follow up with that by asking an inquiry into how does one plead and prove a case in arbitration? The best example of a red flag I ever had was a client came to me, wanted to use an agent. Well, the agent had been actually criminally convicted of bribery in another reported case. So I was able to say, you have clear evidence that in a prior business context, they engaged in bribery and corruption. And that was enough for that client to decline to use that agent. But now take that same fact scenario where you have an agent who has been hired. There is a prior publicly reported case where the agent was convicted of bribery. And I have that as a red flag or evidence. Number one, how do I get that admitted? And two, what is that evidence of other than a prior conviction or prior act of bribery? How do you use that as an argument within the context of this debate you've been talking about, Jan? Well, here, I think there's a few questions. One of the questions, of course, is when you would want to introduce that. You know, If you're using this when you're making your allegation, defending it, or if this is something that has come to light at a later point in, in the process and then in the procedure, and then you need to ask for permission to introduce it. So you know, there's a little bit of a question of sequencing of when that would fit within the procedural stage of the case. Another question is, and I suppose fundamentally is, how will the tribunal treat that information? Some tribunal, I would argue, will say, well, you know, this is a very relevant, very on point, and actually we can rely on that to draw some consequences. And there would be a discussion about what consequences to draw. And some tribunals could say, well, you know, this is not direct, this is informative, but we need more. If you don't have more, well, we can't come to the conclusion you'd like us to draw. It's definitely something that parties have tried to use. And like Jan said, tribunals have come to differing decisions as to what weight, if any, they're willing to give to those sort of prior investigations, prior guilty pleas, or prior resolutions in the corruption space. What are the types of litigation disputes or cases that tend to attract anti-robbery, anti-corruption issues? We touched on one large one earlier, which is third parties. So contracts between companies and third party agents, those are, that's one category I would say that attracts that. Another category is contracts with government entities where there is an allegation of corruption in sort of obtaining that contract. I think that's another category where, where we've seen arbitration. In my mind, those are sort of the two main categories, but Jan, there may be some others to highlight as well. Yeah, these are certainly the two main categories. And then, you know, another category I would add is maybe more limited to the investor state arbitration context where, where the state is uh, raising corruption as part of its defense to argue that the investor shouldn't be able to benefit from the protection of bilateral investment treaty. Earlier in this podcast series, I had the chance to visit with one of your partners, Mike Honecky, and we talked about internal investigations being utilized in subsequent criminal or civil actions. And that podcast focused on a U.S. federal district court case. But what about underlying investigations in using those or not using those in international arbitrations? Are they discoverable? If they are discoverable, can they be introduced? Or is arbitration going a different direction 
regarding internal investigations, and let me wind it up with, probably directed towards you, Laura, are internal investigations receiving more scrutiny and becoming more important because of these developments? So I think in internal investigations are used in some of these disputes, but I think it's more in the context of using the outcome of the investigation. So using evidence or facts that were learned during the investigation to either say, third party, we are not going to pay you. And then if the third party brings a case against the company, using some of the red flags or other potential evidence of corruption that was uncovered during the investigation, using that as a defense to the third party claim. So I think internal investigations are used in that way. And then I think sort of to your last question of, are they becoming, I think it was, are they becoming more important in this context? I think they are important in giving companies the ability to not continue with potentially corrupt behavior. So learning about the underlying facts and then giving companies the ability to stop making potentially corrupt payments and bring themselves even more liability and criminal or civil exposure in the future. So if in the course of an investigation, a company is continuing to make corrupt payments, obviously that's less than ideal and will bring a company more exposure. So the investigation's ability to uncover that evidence and help the company put a stop to any ongoing conduct, I think is very important. What is the role of the compliance professional? Obviously, compliance professionals should be involved in a contract negotiation and there should be protections in the contract, but that's only the starting point. How do you advise clients who are compliance professionals to prepare for having a ultimate arbiter of a contract uh, in the form of an international arbitration arbiter or uh, arbitration panel? What's their role? That's a great question, Tom. Although the arbitration community has been developed experience in recent years about how to handle, how to address these questions, a little bit of a more recent trend or a more recent question is what can the compliance community do to prepare or anticipate and help manage this, these disputes if they do arise. And here, I think what is significant is that compliance professionals should assume that one day, perhaps, their work may be used or may be at the center of a commercial dispute of an international arbitration. There are cases where the parties fight over how due diligence was conducted, what policies were in place, whether the documentation was appropriate, whether the parties provided their reports or not, how deep the due diligence was, and so on and so forth. Some of the think the best practices that apply to running an effective compliance program here also have an element that would feed into thinking about strategies to defend or bring arbitration proceedings. And so here we have documentation, importance of documentation, importance of clearly setting out what was done and when and keeping good records, but also taking a bit of a more proactive role in working with litigation teams in-house when the potential for a dispute arises, either because there's a notice or a claim that's been come to perform a, a risk assessment of the relationship and take a closer look at some of the compliance risks that may or may not be relevant to the dispute that will follow. I would say that really in the sort of day-to-day -day business or day-to-day -day life of a compliance officer, recognition that potential arbitration is down the road, it won't really change your day-to-day -day practices and things you should be doing anyway. You should be maintaining proper documentation of the due diligence you're conducting. You should have those sorts of records and you should be doing a fulsome review of your third parties and you should be monitoring them throughout the course of your relationship with them. So on kind of a daily basis, the potential that this ends up in arbitration won't really change a compliance professional's behavior. Where the real change comes in is when this is potentially coming to a claim or litigation, making sure the compliance 
professional is involved and understands that this potential claim exists or this claim exists and is in a position to provide potentially very useful evidence against a claim or in sort of helping to assert a claim. So it won't really affect your day to day, but it is informative to know that it's possible. When people think about, oh, there's potential litigation and things I'm working on may be out there, people take maybe a little more careful. So maybe that affects in a bit, but I think in sort of best practices, day-to-day behavior where the real change comes in is the potential for a claim. I'd like to ask you guys about this type of dispute resolution mechanism down the road. Do you see this uh, now that anti-bribery, anti-corruption has moved really towards a public policy? And as we know from the Biden administration's announcement in December, a national security issue for the United States, do you see this continuing to grow in international dispute resolution, particularly in the arbitration realm? I do. I think it's going to be continue to be a growing trend as more companies globally become more attuned to these issues. By these issues, I mean sort of anti-corruption compliance type matters and start cutting off contracts sometimes. Often those will have arbitration clauses. And so I, I think this will be a trend that continues over time. Jan, how about from where you sit in Paris? Well, I hear Paris is a, is a major center for international arbitration, and France you know, is now also a major jurisdiction when it comes to international anti-corruption enforcement. So uh, it would be a good city to see uh, a, lot, a lot of developments in this space. But more generally, what I would say is that the mm-hmm. anti-corruption movement has now become so mature internationally, especially when it comes to inter- international companies, that you're seeing not just you know, arbitration clauses in contracts, but you're also seeing more sophisticated and robust compliance clauses and compliance undertakings and obligations. And so there may be more disputes that center on compliance-related obligations. And I think you're going to see also a, you know, a new generation of, of arbitrators, of practitioners, of in-house teams that come now more experienced and and are going to take these discussions to a new new level. And finally, I'd say also you're going to see other compliance-related questions arise in in arbitration proceedings. So, you know, today we're speaking about anti-corruption compliance, but I think you're going to see more disputes also related to, you know, sanctions compliance, ESG compliance, and and other topics. So arbitration, I think, and and compliance will continue to evolve together in the next Unfortunately, we are near the end of our time for this episode, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted any more information on this topic, the Hughes Hubbard anti-corruption and international uh, internal investigations practice, where would be the best place for them to go? The Hughes Hubbard website would be the best place to go. And we do an annual FCPA alert. This year was the first time we included a chapter on the intersection between anti-corruption and arbitration. So there'll be some more details, some case examples in that chapter um, that would relate to kind of the topic at hand, but sort of more generally, the alert will, it provides background and overviews of all the enforcement actions over the last two years and some useful anti-corruption information. Well, guys, this has been a great episode. I wanted to thank you again for first your article and to take the time to visit with me about it. I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you very much. And thank you all for listening.